because in my heart I don't say I think I hope I say I know and you know there's another element in our lives that we don't think much about and that's the element of faith everything we do is by faith 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 everything when you sat in that chair had you ever sat in that chair before by faith you just sat down in it you had faith that people wouldn't build a chair that wouldn't hold you Everything we do is by faith. All right, take the same faith, put it in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you will know who Jesus is. Um, this is our fifth week in a series called True Faith. Last week, we were in chapter two, the beginning parts, and we talked about partiality and or favoritism, right? These are things that take place even today. As we look at, at what's taking place in James, um, it's not something that was just taking place at that time, <coughs> but it also takes place in churches today. Can we be honest, church? And say that that happens. We have cliques. We have certain people we hang out with. There's favoritism. There's partiality. And so we talked about getting rid of those things. It's not of God because he talks about the, the law, the, the, the royal law. And then it's loving God and loving people. Loving God and loving people, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. And so with the main question we asked last week was how do we treat people? How do we treat people? That, that will be clearly shown by the way we react to things or our, our, our actions, right, is how we, we treat people. Why I bring that up again in, in the first part of chapter 2 is this ties into what we're speaking about today. This is one of the hardest and or debated texts in the Word of God, I believe. One of those. As we jump into chapter 2, because here's what happens. It poses a question, and this question I'm sure we've, we've all thought about, or this question we've all debated. Are we saved by grace or are we saved by our works? That's what, that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit today. Ephesians 2.8. I'm going to give you a verse. For, it's for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. So again, right out of the gate. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So that grace we have received. And we have been saved through the faith that we put in Christ. Because of that grace. This is not of your own doing. There's nothing we can do. So I'm going to answer the question right now. There's nothing that we can do for that salvation. It is not by our own doing. It is a gift of God. So we freely have received that gift, yes? We have been given that gift freely. He says, Lord, Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, given us that gift of eternity, not as a result of our works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship. So listen to that. Not a result of our works. That gift is not given to us because of anything we did. So that no one can boast. It's saying, we can't boast saying, look what I did. I died on that cross. You did not. Jesus did. So there's nothing you can boast about or anything you can do works related that says, oh, I did this and this is why I get to go to heaven. That's not the truth. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we're creating Christ Jesus for those things which God prepared beforehand. I love this that we should walk in them. So God's already prepared those good things, those good works that we will do for him. He's already prepared them for us. And now we get to walk in them. What a blessing that is, right? That when we get to walk in Christ, walk in, in the road that he's given us, walk in, in what he has for our life. I think it's very good. So we're going to mention two things. I'm going to answer really quick. What does faith mean is the first question. And what does works mean? I'm going to throw this out there. What does faith mean? Faith is trust in. In trusting in Jesus. When you say, I have faith in Christ, what you're saying is, I trust in God. I trust in Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He rose again. He paid the penalty for me that I could not pay. Right? That's us saying, I have faith in Christ. He did everything. I didn't do anything. It's all because of him that now I can have faith in him and have eternity in Christ. We get that? That's faith, right? We trust in him. We believe that who he said he was was who he said he was. That was the absolute truth. He is the son of God. He is God and he reigns and he rules. So we say, I trust in God 
And second part to that is I obey God. He's our anchor. He's our righteousness, right? So when we say I have faith, I'm trusting in him, but now I'm obeying him. I have obedience to the gospel. I have obedience to what he says. So again, there's many people, because we're going to answer this through, that say I believe, I believe, but there's nothing that actually takes place. Nothing that takes place. And so we're going to work through that. What does that mean? Faith and trust in God and obeying God, the gospel, obeying what God says to us. What does works mean? This is the way James is going to portray it. James speaks of works done in obedience to the gospel. The works that he's speaking of is obedience to the gospel. So when you say, I have faith, there's action that then come, comes out. Does that make sense? I say, I have faith in Jesus. Therefore, there's something inside of me that's taking place, that work that's being done. And now, what comes out? The work that God can do through me, right? That's what comes out. And so we need to answer that really quick because, again, it's debated all, all across the world on what these things mean. James speaks of works being done in obedience to the gospel. Works, it's the effect. It's the fruit that is produced from your life being changed. If you say you have faith, and this is true saving faith, there will be action that takes place because what's happening is your life is radically changing. Yes? And some of you will go, well, you've been here, right? Where you go, look, I've given my life to Jesus. I've handed my life over to Jesus. And now you're like, there's things changing. I'm not doing the same thing I've done before. I'm not doing the stuff that I did in the past. And you're going, what's going on? That's true saving faith. God's radically changing your heart. We, can, we talk about this often here at NHCC, but where, where your life is here, right? Maybe you're here in the present. You look at the past and you realize my life has radically changed. Yes? Because of that, the Lord's been doing the work in you. And that's obviously what needs to take place. So the works, the effects and the fruit that is produced from your life being changed. Naturally, what will happen is you'll love God and you'll love people. That will be the natural thing that takes place. After you say yes to Jesus, that will happen. Works are the effect. And it's genuine. It won't be just, oh, I received it. Now I'm just going to do all these things because of the law. No, it'll naturally happen because you see God's heart for people. You see God's heart for this world. And you want nothing else than to see the whole entire world radically change. Yes? Because you want them to receive that same hope and that same love, that same grace, that same mercy that you've received. Because it's amazing. Yes, church? It's absolutely incredible. And so again, if we say we have faith, something radical will take place. We will see a difference in our life. If we believe God will do a work in us so he can do a work through us. So let's get that out there. I'm excited. Again, jumping into James chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 14. The title of the message, if you're taking notes, is genuine faith. Our first point here, I'm going to lay it out. Faith that is useless. Faith that is useless. All right, verse 14 in chapter 2, it says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled. Imagine that. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? What does it profit? That's the question he asks. What does it profit? If someone is in need and we don't help them, what good is your faith? That's what he's saying. If someone is in need and you don't help them, what good is your faith? Because again, what's, what's, look at the analogy he's given us or look at what he's saying. He's saying, be blessed and be on your way. There's no helping. Therefore, he's saying it's useless. So you have a, a friend. Look at the text. It's saying somebody who's naked, and who cannot have daily food. So again, when you picture this in your mind, it's someone that obviously doesn't have any clothes or has very, uh, a little amount of clothes. They can't have clothing because they don't have money or whatever it is. And second to that, they don't have daily food. So that's saying they cannot eat on a regular basis. Struggling, yes? Someone who's in need. And it says this, and you respond with this, be blessed and be filled. What a glorious day it is. Can you imagine that? How would you feel if you were that person? How would that feel? That's what it's saying is it, your faith is useless if that's your response to that. Your faith is absolutely useless. Why aren't you helping your brother or your sister? Why aren't you? Be blessed and be filled. That's the response. Again, picture yourself in, in that position and the heart that, that, that you might feel if, if a brother or sister was coming to you in, in that type of form. 
My hope is as a church, we would respond and take action. What can I do for you? How can I help you? Right? That's the heart behind it, loving people. But again, he says, what does it profit? Be blessed, be on your way. The, the response here is we're missing something. We're missing something very clear. And, and again, as he says, let's read it one more time. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? It profits nothing. It profits absolutely nothing. We barely miss it. I'm going to call it this, intellectual faith. You can have all the knowledge. You can, you, can, you can search the scriptures. You can do everything you can to know every single verse in this Bible. But here's the thing. A lot of times people miss it. And they miss it very closely. It's from the head to the heart. Intellectually, <laughs> they're saying, look, I can say I believe all day long. And I can say I have this intellectual faith. I know, the, I know everything in the Bible. I know every single verse in the Bible. Whatever it is you, you claim. But if it never affects here, what good is it? What good is it? You can walk around all puffed up all day long. And you can debate people all day long and crush people with your debates or whatever it is. But if it doesn't affect your heart, it is useless. That's what he's saying. It's useless. That's heavy stuff, right? Because all day, there's so many times I've debated with uh, atheists, agnostics, uh, whoever, J-dubs, whatever it is. And you debate these people, right? And you have conversations with these people. And you want to love on these people and you want to care for these people, right? And here's what's happening. There's tons of knowledge, but there's no effect. There's no action. I know all these things. I can tell you it. But is it actually doing something in your heart? Is it changing you? It's useless. It's, it's all intellect. It's all, look, I, I have it, but it's not affecting your heart. We're going to miss it. We're going to miss it. Here's the thing. Billy Graham, can I have that chair for me really quick? Billy Graham says this in the beginning of the video as we talked about it. What he says is this. As you walk into this room, maybe this is your first time here. I love this analogy he gives. He says, look, you walk into a room for the first time. And let's say this is your first time in church. You don't walk into the room. You don't look at the chair and you do this. And maybe you do if you do. Okay. You don't do this. Do, anyone? No? Right? You don't go like this. You don't start checking. You don't, you don't have a measuring tape out. You don't do anything like this. You don't, you don't start stomping on it. There's n none of this is taking place, right? That, that doesn't happen. That's not something normal. I mean, it might happen, but it's not something you do on a regular basis. You, why? You have faith that this chair is going to hold you, yes? Every, you that, every single one of you that walked in this room, you have faith in this chair that it'll hold you. You don't need to flip it upside down, check it, make sure the steel is right. Where's the steel? Who made this chair? Right? What manufacturer made this chair? No one's asking those questions. There's a reason for that. You have faith that this chair can hold you. There's one thing to say that it can hold you. There's one thing to sit down. There's one thing to say that it can hold you. There's another thing to actually sit down in it. That's the thing. And Billy Graham's talking about that. You don't walk in. You believe and you have faith that this chair can hold you. But let's have a, let's have a conversation. Okay, sir, you believe that this chair can hold you. Yes, absolutely. I believe the steel looks great. I checked it out myself. It looks awesome. It will hold me. Okay, have a seat. I don't need to. Why? I just know. I, it can hold me. I got it. Take an action, Right? Take an action. It's saying, I believe and I have faith that this can do it. Let's do this instead. Let's take the next step. Make sense? Let's take the next step. That's what he's saying. It's useless. If we just, say, if we just sit there and go, no, be blessed, brother. Be blessed, sister. How about this? Let's take the next step of action and go, no. If I say genuinely I have faith in Jesus, then I'm going to do what he tells me to do out of the obedience of the gospel. Not because I have to, because I love him. That's why. Because I love Jesus so much and Jesus tells me to love people. And guess what? That is very difficult and hard. Anyone else agree? It absolutely is. But here's the thing. He gives us joy and grace and mercy that we do not deserve. We don't deserve any of it. None of it. But I'm thankful that he's given it to me and in return I'm going to give it to every single other person I see in my life. Why? Because he's done a radical change in me. And he's given me something I do not deserve. And yes, people are difficult and people are hard. But let me tell you this church. Let's sit down in the chair. Let's do it. Let's, let's take action. Let's go love people the way God has told us to love people. Let's be obedient to the gospel and let's be obedient to what he tells us to do. Amen? Amen. 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 He's good, church. He's very, very good. And again, we need to think about those things. As we go in our life, as we, we have faith, right? We look upon the gospel. We look at the, the gospel. We look at what the word of God tells us to do. Let's be obedient to what he has for us. So again, he says, 
Be warmed and be filled. We don't want to be a church like that. We want to be a church that's of action that says, you know what, Lord, you saved my life. And because of that, I'm going to tell the whole entire world and I'm going to do what you tell me to do out of the obedience of my heart. I'm going to love those people the way you love them. I'm going to love them. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to do that. So again, faith will show by the way we respond to it. If we trust and obey, we will have works. That's naturally speaking. It will take place. We're not saved by those things. Because he's going to later on say, remove your works and tell me about your faith. We're not saved by those things. But it will be a response to us saying we have genuine faith. Loving his people properly. And here's one thing I'm going to mention. A tree is known by its fruits. A tree is absolutely known by its fruits. So let's look at Matthew 7, verse 20. It says this. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruits, so you can identify people by their actions. Listen to that. You can identify a tree by its fruits, so you can identify people by their actions. Not everyone who calls out to me. Listen to this, church. Listen to this. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Intellect. They will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. That's heavy stuff. Heavy, heavy stuff. We can look all day long in Revelation and we find that the end, the end of the, the church, right? The end of the reign. And this is what happens is people all day long will say, Lord, Lord. And he says, you won't even enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? They missed it. They missed it. It wasn't genuine. It wasn't genuine. It's all here. And it never affects the heart. There's never an action that takes place that says, Lord, I really do have faith in you and I want you to change my life. I want you to change my heart. It doesn't happen. We can say all day long and raise our hands and say yes, and, but it, w w there, would, there would be some change. There would be a life-changing experience that happens because what you're saying is, Lord Jesus, replace all that is within me with you. That will have change. It will take place. So again, a tree is known by its fruits. Let's continue on in verse 17. So we have faith that is useless. Again, church, we don't want to be like this. We want to take action in those times. We want to be able to pour the gospel out on those people and love those people properly. In verse 17, it says this, Thus, also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, <coughs> You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. I love that. Again, but someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. But show me your faith by your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. That's heavy again. Even the demons believe and tremble. So he says, look, I'll show you my faith by my works. Take away the works. Is there actual faith? That's the question he's saying. A man says, works is all we need. Is saying my future and eternity is based upon me. That's what it's saying. If, again, let me read that again. If a man says, works is all we need to do. That's it. We don't need to worry about the faith part. We just need to work our way to heaven. We need to do the things that the law says. And that's all that matters is we have the checkbox, right? I did this today. I did this today. I did this today. Great. My list is done. I'm going to go on with my day, right? Those are the works base. And what he's saying is if that is the case, if works is all you need, you are saying your future and eternity is based upon your works. It's based upon what you do. That is not truth. I'm going to speak it very clear. That is not. What you're saying is, if that's what you're saying this morning, and that's how you feel, what you're saying is Jesus didn't have to die on the cross for your sins. He did it. That's what you're saying. So remove Jesus. Remove him out of history. And honestly, just throw this out the door. Throw it out the door. It, you don't need it. That's what you're saying is, if you're saying all it's based upon me and the works that I do, remove Jesus. He didn't need to die on the cross for your sins. He didn't need to ra be raised again. He didn't need to do any of that. Because you can clearly do it on your own. It's not the truth. We can't. We need Jesus. He had to die on the cross for our sins. He had to, three days later, raise from the grave, right? He had to do that for us. Because so he can take on all the sins of the world, past, present, future, church, for you and for me. And if we say that he, that it's all based on us and the works that we do, remove him from the cross. There's no need for him to do it. 
To me, that's sad because he's given you a free gift, a free gift of salvation and eternity. And all you got to do is receive that gift. And I'm telling you, if you do, God's going to radically change your life and flip it upside down. And it's amazing. So again, a man that says, works is all I need is saying my future and eternity is based upon me and what I do. Let me read this. Matthew Henry says this. You make a profession and you say you have faith. I make such no boast, but leave my works to speak for me. Now give an evidence of having the faith you profess without the works if you can, and I will soon let you see how my works flow from faith and are the undoubted evidence of its existence. The undoubted evidence of its existence. If God has radically changed your life, there will be evidence of it. Yes, church? There will be evidence if God has changed your life. There will be something that takes place. It won't just be like, okay, Lord, I believe, and then we're on our way. There will be change. <coughs> Absolute change will happen. So again, you make a profession. You say you have faith. I make no such boast. Again, because we're not boasting in what we are and what we do. We only boast in Jesus. Believe my works to speak for me. It's saying, if that radical change took place, people are going to see the change or they're going to know that you're different. Yep. Yes. They're going to know that you're different by the way you act, by the way you respond. We, we all know this, that over time those things take place. It isn't all of a sudden. Everything changes in an instant. It can be. Maybe that's your experience with Christ. That's great. But a lot of times, let's talk about anger for one minute. It doesn't just all of a sudden flip and all of a sudden you're not angry anymore. That's, that's a character thing that takes place and God starts to refine you, mold, and shape you. And why I mention this is because... A lot of times, the enemy wants to discourage you saying, you're not really a Christian. You don't really have faith. Look at you still get angry the same exact way you did four months ago. The enemy does that. <laughs> and so this morning, I want to speak against that saying no. That this is an overtime thing. Over the course of time in your relationship with Christ, it's going to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And you will see change start to take place. And it's amazing. Again, radical things will happen. And so don't let the enemy discourage you from that. <coughs> don't let the enemy say, no, again, just because of your past, whatever it is, God has something great for you. There's a future for you. And as, as Matthew Henry says at the very end, let me let you see how my works flow from faith and, the, uh, and are the undoubted evidence of its existence. There will be evidence if we show genuine faith. And look at this last part in verse 19. You believe that there is one God you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. We talked about this a little earlier when we talked about intellectual faith, right? It's saying even the, de even the demons believe and tremble. So get this. Even the demons believe and tremble. One more time. Even the demons believe, the demons believe, who are against God, they believe and they tremble. So when you think about people, when you think about those around you, when you think about the gospel, you think about any of that, when people say, well, I believe, there's many people in this world that say, I believe. Anyone ha ever met those people? I believe there's a God, right? Many people say that. All day long, there's people that say that. I believe in God. Even the demons believe. Does that change their life? Did that radically change them? No. Why? Because they're against God. That doesn't mean they don't believe in him. So again, it's radical that James goes here, but there's a reason for it. Many say that they believe, but believing and having faith are completely different. They're completely different. Believing and having faith are completely different. Saying I believe could be the exact same thing a demon says, just as it says that even the demons believe and tremble. Mark 3, it says this. Mark 3, verse 11. <coughs> and whenever they possessed by evil spirits. It's whenever people were possessed by evil spirits, caught sight of him. So they're talking about Jesus. When, it, when, an, when a demon was inside somebody, the evil spirit caught sight of Jesus. The spirits would throw themselves to the ground in front of him, shrieking. So listen to that. A person is demon possessed. When they caught sight of Jesus as he was walking around, the spirits would then throw those bodies they were in onto the floor, shrieking. That's heavy stuff. They would throw themselves before Jesus and they would say this, you are the son of God. They believe, right? They know who he is. Looks in the next part though. You are the son of God. But Jesus sternly commanded the spirits not to reveal who he was, specifically for that time. But here's the thing. 
They throw themselves on the floor and they say, you are the son of God. They believe in who he is, but they're completely against him. So when you ask the question, well, again, people can say all day long, I believe, I believe there is a God. But is that genuine faith? Is that actual genuine faith? Because even the demons believe and they tremble. So we got to take that into account of going, wow, this is kind of crazy to think about, right? They believe and tremble, but this isn't a saving faith. One can say, I believe and be completely lost for the rest of their life. Completely lost. True saving faith can be seen and recognized. It can be seen and recognized with our own two eyes. When you say, I have true and genuine faith, saving faith, I've given my life over to Jesus. There's been a transaction. He's given me a new life. You will see and you will recognize a changed life from this. Yes, church? You will see it take place. So again, us saying we believe, we clearly say the demons say the same exact thing, but a changed life will occur in verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works because radical things will happen and action will take place. So we understand that, that there's something that takes place in our heart and it is genuine. Again, we don't want faith that is useless. We don't want faith that is dead. We want faith that is absolutely genuine. Let's continue reading in verse 20. <coughs> but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? So listen to that. Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works faith was made perfect? <coughs> and the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. So again, Abraham believed God, but he, but he showed it by the genuine faith, showing action, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So God looked at him and said, this is a righteous man. And he was called the friend of God. Verse 24, you see, then, then a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. This is some stuff, this is some tough stuff to wrap our minds around. It's hard. I believe the word of God sometimes is very difficult as we're reading this and we're trying to break it down and understand. But James brings up two uh, specific people in the word of God who are completely opposite. And I love, I love that he does this because we're going to take a look at their life. Abraham. It says, Abraham was a friend of God. Rahab, on the other side, was a harlot, a prostitute, and belonged to the enemies of God. The enemies of God. We'll learn about her in just a second. Abraham showed how much he trusted God by obeying him. <coughs> he showed that in verse 20 again. But do you know, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by the works when he offered up Isaac by his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? Again, think about that. That the works and the faith together were made perfect perfect. Abraham obeyed God. God said, sacrifice your son, Isaac, your only son, on the altar. So think about that, receiving that message from God. Take your son up on the hill, sacrifice him on an altar. You're thinking, this is crazy. This is crazy, right? But out of obedience, he listened. God also said that through Isaac, many of the other promises will take place. So here's probably, I, Abraham's probably confused. God's not confusing. There was a test in this. But what he says this, I want you to take up your son and I want you to set him on the altar. And Abraham's probably thinking, God, you said that through Isaac, all these promises would be made. Okay, I trust you. Again, faith, right? He's saying, I trust you. And out of that trust and that faith, comes obedience. So he's obedient. He says, okay, I'm going to take him up on the altar. He trusts God. His faith was demonstrated by that work. His faith was demonstrated by the way that he took up Isaac, laid him on the altar. And we all know the rest of the story. As he is about to sacrifice him, guess what? God shows up and says, nope, that's not happening. But what a faithful servant he is. And obedient he was to listen to God. And obviously God does not allow him to do that. But Abraham was not, Warren Risby says this, Abraham was not saved by faith plus works, but by a faith that works. 
I love that of faith that works. And so we see Abraham again, listening, being obedient and trusting God. Now on the other side, we see Rahab. Again, a harlot. If you don't know who a harlot is, it's a prostitute. A prostitute in that land. Rahab was a prostitute, showed her faith. She obeyed and she trusted God and with a very minimal amount of information that she was given. But here's the thing. A man named uh, Joshua, he sent spies into the land of Jericho to check it out. They're, this is where the promised land, they're entering it in. They see Jericho. He says, go check out the land. I want you to see what's going on there. They meet Rahab. They show up. She basically owned this guest house at the entrance. And so a lot of people would kind of go to this area if they were coming to see Jericho, visit Jericho, whatever it is. So it was common for people to enter into her home. But again, she's a prostitute. It says this, she met them. She hears the truth of what's going to happen, what's happening from the spies and what they're telling her, what God will do. She then has that faith. She then has faith, takes action by hiding the spies from the people of Jericho. So she's given minimal information here, minimal information about what's taking place. We don't read a ton of, of it in scripture. We just know she knows what's taking place. She knows these spies are there for a reason because God's going to come in and take over this land and he's going to use these people to take it over. And again, so she reacts to that says, okay, I believe this. I have faith in this. And therefore hides the spies from the people of Jericho. She then is saved once they come back to the land to take over Jericho. That's what happens. What a beautiful thing this is. Because it shows even this a little amount of faith. Again, she, who knows? She didn't know. She only knew what they told her. She believed it has faith and she took action immediately. Hiding the spies. What a beautiful contrast. Here's why. You have one end, Abraham, a friend of God. Someone who, who has been a part of that, right? Doing what God says to do, obeying and trusting him and, and many other things that God asked him to do. And then the other hand, Rahab, a prostitute. So we'd go, why are we in the same box here, right? Why do we have these two opposite people being spoken about? And to me, it shows God's grace. It shows God's love and mercy for all people. It doesn't matter your background, where you come from, what you've done. What he's saying is, I love you. And if you would just put your faith and trust in me, I can do something radical in your life. It doesn't matter your title. It, it, none of that matters, your stature, your finances, whatever it is. You're a daughter or a son of Jesus. And it's mind blowing, just the heart that Jesus has. So when we talk about these things of having genuine faith and taking action, what it's saying is this, church, if you have genuine faith, you're gonna love God and you're gonna love people. And we're gonna see that take place in your heart and in your life. And it will truly show because it'll be genuine. You won't do it just to have the check boxes. You'll do it because you've seen God do it in your own life. And as we said before, God does a work in us so he can do a work through us. Amen, church? It will happen. So again, as you see Rahab, mention this really quick. Her mind knew the truth. Her heart was stirred by that truth. And her will acted on the truth. She proved her faith by what she did. Beautiful story. Beautiful story as we see this. In verse 26, it says this, For the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Let me give you a glimpse. Faith is the root. Good works are the fruit. Right? So when we talk about planting a seed, we mentioned this before, we plant a seed. The only way that seed is going to grow by what? By watering it. <coughs> and as it's watered, we're going to see what that tree is going to turn into. Yes? If the tree does not go anywhere, we're going to realize the tree's dead. The seed couldn't grow. The roots couldn't grow. Something didn't happen. But again, faith is the root. So think about that seed, the root that, that is implanted. Boom. When you say yes to Jesus, that is implanted, that faith is the root. Good works are the fruit as they come out. And we must see to it that we have both. Both have to take place. We must not think that either without the other will justify and save us. This is the grace of God. So again, none of those things can justify and save us. It's by grace that we've been saved. This is the grace of God wherein we stand and we should stand to it, Matthew Henry says. If there's genuine faith, we will see the fruit. As we mentioned before, a tree is known by its fruit. It's known by its fruit. And if it's genuine, people will see the fruit that will come out of your life and they will see radical things take place.
I'm going to ask one more question. I'm just going to have a seat. Is that all right? Here's the thing. When I was thinking about this whole entire thing of James 2 and, and, and faith and, and works and all these things, and, and I take a look at just the world in, in general, and I go, it's so saddening because so many people believe or say that they believe, but there's, no, there's nothing genuine. There's nothing radical that's taking place in their life. Or on the opposite end that say, you know what? I don't need God. I just need to do all of these things and I'll make my own road to heaven. It's not truth. It's a lie. And people settle into those lies because it's, it's something they've been told or, or even something that they found on the internet. Let me tell you this. The internet has ruined so many people. And at the same time, I'm not saying it's bad. God can use it for his glory. But here's the question I have for you today. What do you believe in? And an even better question, who do you believe in? Because if you say you really do believe in something, <coughs> that belief will turn into something, a life changed. And I'm going to tell you, outside of Jesus, your life will not radically change. It won't. It won't. You know, when I was 18 years old, I'll tell you this a little bit. You guys know a little bit about my life. But as I'm raised in a Christian home, this generally happens. I don't know why. I was raised in a Christian home my whole entire life. And guess what? I said every single Sunday, I believe. I believe. There was no action that took place. There was no real genuine faith. It just was me saying, I believe. Guess what? I was on worship teams. I played music for kids. I played music for junior high, high schools. For Jesus. And I claimed it. And I said, I believe. But it was not genuine at all. It was not genuine. I showed up every single Sunday, did my thing, 6.45 in the morning till 2. Long day. No, no genuine faith at all. It was a facade. And here's why I say this. <coughs> I don't want that to be us. I don't want you walking in the room every Sunday as a facade saying, you know what? Yeah, I believe. I'm just going to keep going. But there's no action. There's no real genuine faith that takes place. There's no radical change in your heart. I want to see radical things take place. And let me tell you this. If you have a heart for Jesus and you have a heart for people, you're going to want to see those radical things take place because you're going to want to see a valley changed. You're not going to stand around anymore. You're not going to just sit around anymore and wait. It's, there's no time to wait anymore. There's no time. Jesus is coming soon. We don't know when that is. I would hope one day that I do get to fly in the sky and be raptured. What an amazing experience that would be, right? But I have no clue. But my hope is this, that as I say, keep talking about Jesus and we keep talking about Jesus and we keep talking about Jesus and we keep loving people the way that we should, that a world will be radically changed because they see the joy, the mercy, and the grace that we've received and we keep pouring it out to the people around us, telling them there is something better than what you have. His name is Jesus, and He is hope. He is every single thing that you absolutely need. And that would be us every single day. You don't need a platform, church. I told you this a million times. You do not need a stage. You do not need a guitar. You have your voice, and you have what God has given you, and He can do something radical through you, even if it is a 9-to-5 job. I have one, too. You can do radical things in that. When you go to work, you show people the joy that God's given you. When you go to Starbucks, you show the joy people have given you, the, the Lord's given you. Wherever you go, you can be used in a radical way. Stop saying no. Let's see that genuine faith take action. And let's do something for the glory of God. Yes, church? That's what we have to do to see a changed world. And so what I'm asking is we would stop coming in with, with this faith or just belief of going, yeah, I get it, but there's, no, there's nothing that takes place in my heart. Don't let it end here. Let it impact your soul. Let it impact your heart. And let's see a changed world. Amen, church? Let's stand and let's worship.